Hey, I'm Fred. And I'm Ant. And this is Create a Generation. Create a Generation of Hype. Fred Rico. Yes. What is happening this week? Well, this week we are chatting to Dan Morrison from Comedy Central. And then we had like hundreds of submissions come in. There was one that was just like drawings of like rats that had like, <laughs> like a kind of a narrative written next to it. Although it was actually quite funny. We just couldn't tell if it was a real pitch or not. And to be honest, it's stuck with me for so long now that Memorable. maybe we should revisit it. Like, just come back to it. He's a senior programmer though. <laughs> Stop it. What else? Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to chat about the opportunities for creators to cross over and work with big media companies. Yeah, because those big media companies are really focusing on online content. Yeah, exactly. Um, Comedy Central and other media companies are actually really keen to work with YouTube creators. Yes, and because they're so keen, they want you to pitch to them. So Dan shares some really great insights on how to pitch to the, these big media companies, especially what to do, but also what not to do. Indeed, some really good tips here. Frederico, before we get started, we've been working really hard in the background on our own online course called Changer College. The online college just for content creators. Check it out at changercollege.com. That's C-H-A-N-G-E-R college.com. Hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Dan Morrison. Hello. Welcome to Creator Generation. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Uh, I like... I like introducing our guests, but I do a terrible job of it. So I've decided to outsource that to our guests. Yeah, no, no, no. Who are you? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you do? Your intro wasn't too bad then, anyway. But that's fine. Oh, I just gave. I can introduce myself. Your name. Um, yeah, that's all I gave. Well, yeah, I am Dan Morrison. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I work for Comedy Central. Um, I'm a senior programmer there. I've been with the company Viacom for seven and a half years now, so mostly programming that entire time, bit of MTV there, but mostly Comedy Central. Um, and what I do there is I basically do what I call kind of like the editorial across Australia and New Zealand for the uh, linear channels that we have there, and then also more recently working across the digital side of the business as well, so working with digital on the site, but then also mainly on like Facebook and Instagram for socials at the moment, and kind of working with our international arms of the business as well about new projects and new talent coming through and all that kind of thing and feeding it out to Australian audiences here. So. Bloody hell. Yeah. Do you sleep? Yeah, uh, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. I was actually late last night, but I'm fine. <laughs> you look all right. Yeah, you thank you. Up. Cheers. So Dan, a lot of creators are now looking at that crossover opportunity, right? Yeah. I'm on YouTube, I've done well there, or I'm thinking about you know, starting a YouTube channel. What's the next opportunity for me You know, if I want to go into other platforms? Mm-hmm. So how does someone cross over from YouTube to network or network TV or on the, for example, Comedy Central network itself? Yeah. So previously for us, I think we, when we initially, because we're like in Australia, we're a fairly young company. So we've been in New Zealand for almost 10 years, but only Australia three with our kind of brand presence here. Um, So when we started off here and we launched a website and everything, we went out looking actually for YouTubers who already had a following there. So we went to people like Auntie Donna and um, the guys that did Mike Nolan show and stuff like that. So we as a company actually went out to people who already had that established audience because we were trying to build ours like locally here. So with that, we were kind of looking out into that space, seeing who was doing a good job, who had subscribers, who had an engaged audience basically as well. So sometimes there is that opportunity, I think, with companies like networks that actually do actually just notice that work and see what's working well there. And we went out um, proactively and approached them for those projects and we were like, we want you to be like kind of the face of our new site and I want you to, we want you to create a short form series for us. And we got that out of both the Mike Nolan boys and um, Auntie Donna there. But um, other times as well, we've basically done, I think what I would call like incubator kind of projects, which is stuff where we're seeking people with a good story. They don't necessarily have to have that big uh, like social media following or subscribers there, but talent that we know or like comedians and stuff that we've, Like a lot of the time, like a bunch of us at work have gone to some stand-up shows and stuff and we've seen some stand-ups from some comedians and we're like, yeah, that's us. Like we, (laughs) we feel that, we understand that. That's like our like cheeky kind of, I don't know, yeah, tone of voice, I guess, for Comedy Central. And that's when they're, when we've spoken to them and seen if you've got any ideas and stuff, they kind of come in and float ideas by us and then that kind of, I don't know, grows from there. And if it's like a strong idea, we kind of go with that. And that's been other ways when we've just like straight up commissioned some stuff and not like necessarily relying on that huge base that's there. Um, But then also other opportunities as well. Um, We 
kind of really look to be a broadcast partner for people that are going out there making their own stuff that if they want a bigger platform to go with. So, um, and then a lot of times as well, some people take already like say Screen Australia funding and work with them as well. And they create um, short form series or bigger projects. And uh, we are really like willing. And I think that's definitely a space that we're looking at more now is becoming that broadcast partner for people who are already already created a project or mm. are about to begin a project, have a pilot there and they want to grow that. And then that's kind of where we can kind of come on board and kind of help give that bigger platform there as well if they want to kind of cross over into that TV space. And I think the good thing with our company as well, because it is global, we can hopefully get it in front of more eyeballs across our international teams across the US and stuff like that. So we're hoping to give more more opportunities, I guess, to like local talent that way. Speaking of global, I mean, a lot of the audience here is fairly well spread around the world. Which, yeah. I mean, we obviously are based in Australia, so we talk a lot about that. Yeah. But we like having a, a global approach to, I mean, Viacom being a big global company, yeah. do most of the divisions work in a similar way? So I would say like domestic, which are just Amer- like North America, I kind of siloed in a way. They're definitely doing their own thing. But I think everywhere else in the world is kind of what in um, Viacom International, which is what we call like basically everywhere else that's not America, which is we do follow the same kind of approach to um, finding creators and stuff like that. But international is more going what's going to work for everyone, where the US might ne- not necessarily think about that. They're just like what's going to work for our market. But this new approach with um, Viacom Digital Studio Studios, which is kind of a new initiative that they've started in the last few years, which is just basically let's pump out as much digital content we can across the world. And that's the aim for and goal for everyone across Viacom. That's so that's like MTV, Comedy Central, BET, like everyone. Um, with that, it's more that we're looking for um, any comedians that have content that we that will travel. So, and that's not necessarily just limited to, a lot of it comes out of the UK at the moment, but they're looking at, you know, like Latin America and like South Africa and like anywhere where these creators, like where comedians and their content can travel. So I think with that, um, there's definitely more opportunities, I think, for Australia and um, everyone else that's not necessarily in America to kind of work with Viacom, digital studios in that way, mm. um, because they're kind of looking for more of that content that can travel. And that's the stuff that they're willing to work with us more on from an Australian aspect as well. So that's kind of where the opportunity I think comes through locally here, but definitely internationally as well. Mm. And that's the best thing I think about it now because they're looking to create so much as definitely more opportunities for creators to kind of approach Viacom in that way. Great. Yeah. Before we go too much further, let's just chat about, I mean, Viacom. Vi- yeah. For those who don't know, it is an enormous company, yeah. um, own Paramount, MTV, um, Nickelodeon? Yeah, Nickelodeon, yeah. Comedy Central. Comedy Central. Comedy Central. Yeah. Comedy Central. Yeah. Comedy Central <laughs> Channel 5 in the UK. And um, yeah, and but like, I guess outside of that as well, what you've, uh, you're probably getting to, but they acquired like VidCon recently as well. And there's other businesses outside of that. Like they just acquired a digital streaming platform in America called Pluto TV as well, which is like, that's a whole new space for them as well. So it is something that's definitely like growing just outside just the linear TV channels as well. Great. Yeah. And obviously being a been around for a long time and I guess being seen as quite traditional they've now developed their Viacom digital studios right yeah it's been a really big leap I think for Viacom I know there was a report I think maybe back in March or something that basically in the entertainment media space I think like three years ago Viacom was sitting like 24th in like all the big media companies there and then they jumped up in two years up to ninth place which was still like it was a huge jump for them and they were sitting at like something like 3.5 billion views, mm. which was crazy. So that was, and that, that puts them into the realm of like Buzzfeed and everything. So I think that was also like, I guess a push for the company. You saw all these other youth brands that weren't necessarily like TV focused or anything like that. They're doing a great job of putting out all this content and we're kind of sitting there going, Oh yeah, like watch this show. But that wasn't like, I don't know, social media wasn't for that anymore and no no one wants to just see a promo for a show. So it's just kind of like, how can we adapt this? How can we still have our like tone of voice but in a new space? And I think they're doing that quite well. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And so how do you, like, where do you see that going for you guys at Comedy Central? Do you, does it matter what platform you're creating content for and it, will it sort of just become, you know, quite liquid, fluid across, it's not liquid, fluid yeah. across the, platforms that you know like yeah it's like obviously there's the definitely differences between the platforms like what works as well because like um you can 
easily see differences between what's working on our, like, say, Facebook pages to Instagram kind of thing. Like, we have some formats that the US have put out that seem to really just, like, absolutely go off on Facebook. And it's just, like, that shareable kind of content where I guess Instagram as a platform, it doesn't have that same kind of shareability in a way. Like, if you're just watching a video and stuff like that, to, like, share it, like, if you're putting it on your story, well, it's a flat image or you've got to record your screen and that's a lot of effort where I feel like Facebook, it kind of gets out there a lot quicker and can actually, like, move a lot faster. Um, and then, I guess, as well, like, even different, like, same kind of things that maybe work on Facebook, the US and UK are putting out on their YouTube pages and you might not see exactly the same pickup there. But then sometimes, literally just some of our, like, shoulder content for our shows, like Daily Show and that is doing, like, huge numbers on YouTube. So some of the traditional stuff is still working there, but then some of the other formats that they're creating out of the US is finding traction on YouTube and might not necessarily do on Facebook. So I think it's a lot of trial and error there to see which formats work where. So you might even just see some of these shows just, like, purely go into, you know, one of those platforms because, you know, it works there. It's not necessarily going to work on Facebook. So I might just live on Instagram or IGTV or whatever. So I think, yeah, as I was saying, like this whole thing seems like a lot of trial and error, but I guess that's like the same for a lot of people out there just trying to see like what works and what doesn't. So we're definitely in that stage of creating as much as we can, which is exciting though because you get to see a lot of great stuff out of it as well. So. I guess for a lot of, um, you know, people who are creating comedy content or any content for that matter, thinking about working with someone like Viacom is almost like it doesn't seem like something they can do because it's just yeah. so big. It's such a machine. And they probably think you've got to go through this studio system before you can even chat to them. But from what you said, it doesn't sound like that at all. No. And it's, it, it, I guess it depends in some ways. It's not like we have like previously for in New Zealand, for example, we wanted to create some New Zealand content. So we literally put like, um, like a request for pitch out basically through our PR just sent out like EDM out to everyone and that was picked up by press and then we had like so many submissions come in but at the same <laughs> time we had hundreds of submissions come in but a lot were just absolute shit like we had I think I, I don't know if I had told you guys about this last time but there was one that was just like drawings of like rats that had like, <laughs> like a kind of a narrative written next to it although awesome. it was actually quite funny we just couldn't tell if it was a real pitch or not and there was no real way to like contact them afterwards or what it was meant to be but anyway but yeah so hey you said it's all about experimenting and seeing what's yeah, going exactly. on I reckon the yeah. rat show should get a run to be honest it's stuck with me for so long now that Memorable. maybe we should revisit it like just come back to it hey rat illustrator yeah. if you're listening yeah get in touch yeah with please Dan. do yeah, yeah. I'm you get a run on yeah. Comedy Central, <laughs> yeah. Insta Story or something. Absolutely. No, um, yeah, but so there are opportunities that way where locally we might put a call for action out there. But then also we're all, like free to like open to submissions in that way. It's not, but the thing is as well, it's obviously something that needs to fit the brand at the mm. end of the day. So as much as we can get stuff through, it probably doesn't go up the line too far if it's not something that it's not working or isn't something that we're looking to do mm. right now as well. Like I think a lot of people have, especially with Comedy Central, I think they have this dream that it's just like, oh, like I want to do a half hour scripted show with you. Mm. I want to make it. Mm. And that's not what I, f like that's not how it necessarily works, especially for us. Maybe I think ABC is more probably that, um, that person that's kind of playing in that space so at the moment. Yeah, TV networks basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I guess like tens trying out a few formats and stuff like that. But they, I think a lot of networks kind of steer clear of like scripted comedy just because it's so like hit and miss mm. all the time. And I would say it's been mostly missed for a lot of years now in Australia. <laughs> so that's a bit of a shame there. So I think it is risky in that way. So that's why I think with us as a company now, we're definitely leaning into that short form space because there's – more room for error, I guess, as well. If, like, something doesn't work, like, we can't, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. And then that's the beauty of us kind of experimenting with all these new formats as well as, like, we can see what sticks. But then that's the thing as well. We're still, there's still that space to have that kind of narrative if you want to, but in that short form space. Um, but that's, and also, I guess, because we're looking for stuff to travel as well now, we're kind of looking internationally. So some of that local stuff that we're doing earlier on might not necessarily be the thing that we're going after now although how to create like, before creators pitch to you how do they know what they should be like how do they know what you're interested in what you're not interested in do they just need to look at what's out there or is there some guidance around that yeah i think like a piece of like advice to anyone kind of pitching not necessarily to us but anyone is just kind of you do your research on the brand like i think you need to understand their turn of their tone of voice before you go into those meetings mm. i just think look at what they're doing on socials, look what programming they have on the TV. What is that What is that voice there? Like, what is that mood? Like, think about that before 
you're kind of going in there going, oh, yeah, like, I want you guys to play this as a comedy, but it's like, is it a comedy central comedy? It might be something else. Like, mm. it might fit another brand somewhere. Or, like, so I think that's definitely just, I don't, just a lot of people just need to kind of think, I yes, obviously you really want to make this, but doesn't need to be with this brand just because you just want it to fit because, like, don't force it kind of thing. And so what, what, Tips would you, apart from that, I mean, yep. what other tips would you do when you're approaching someone like, you know, Viacom mm-hmm. um, and you're pitching an idea, just generally, what what are you looking for? What level of prof- professionalism? Are there any tips around structure or how, how should they go about Yeah, it? I think obviously the best thing is um, having some kind of reference point to what your style is as well. Like I think, like sometimes it's fine if we get a one pager, but that's usually if we know, oh, we know the comedian, we know their tone of voice because we've seen them out doing like stand up before, or we can go like watch some of their stand up and kind of get what they're about. I think um, like outside of that as well, having like someone obviously, because we approach like Auntie Donna, they always had this big like library and we could kind of get it. And like, yes, that fits with us. And same with the Mike Nolan boys as well. We can kind of see something that works there. Other times we've had people that do like one-off, like they've had maybe a body of work before that and then they've brought in like a pilot that they're working on, which is a different style to what they've done, but it is more in our tone of voice. So I think you can have like a different kind of, um, I guess, past with content. And then if you're kind of moving into a new space, it's always good to see kind of like a visual representation of that in some way, that's always a good reference point for us to help something get over the line. It's kind of hard to just send something up that's in the form of just a piece of paper, especially when now that we're doing so much more consulting, I think with our international team there, it's great that when you're talking to like, when we're trying to push you across the line to a whole new audience that's probably never heard of you before, having that kind of either if it's stand up or if it's like previous projects that you've worked on that back catalog that people usually have on YouTube, that's the best thing to kind of put forward to them and be like, Mm. oh, this is what they've done before. This is great. And then they've got this idea now and we think it fits. I think that's the best way to kind of get your foot in the door more than anything, rather than just like sending through a one page (laughs) and be like, it's a great idea. I think it's going to do really well. It's just like, okay. Basically have some runs on the board before you knock it Yeah, exactly. But in terms of that, I mean, I know when, you know, traditional networks have um, asked for new talent and you send stuff in, they're looking for new talent that has quite a large audience. Like a talent, not so much much new, but new to the network, Yeah. right? So they'll say, oh yeah, you're new to the network, but you still have like, 10 million subscribers. So <laughs> yeah. we love, you know, yeah. but yeah. like, is that kind of viewership what you're looking for? Or are you just looking for great talent with just some proven runs? Like what's that level? Yeah, it's not, it's not that millions mm-hmm. kind of like, cause we obviously, what I said before, there's a kind of like incubator projects that um, we had where it was like a talent that didn't have that following there, but it was a great idea. But we know we kind of like a lot of that was like stand up for reference that we had from people that we've like seen that. So that was, that's always a good kind of in for us, like knowing that. And I guess like that is a bit biased because like if we haven't seen someone do stand up before, it's kind of hard, but that's the thing as well. It works having, you know, your content from your stand up up on YouTube or something. Cause like, Oh, I can get a quick sense of like who you are in that way. I think, yeah, there's definitely still good to have some runs on the ball, but I think it's more like if you can put out a good quality product as well, that has, I don't know, some merit to it. That's definitely something that we take into consideration. Absolutely. But it is definitely, I like to be honest about it. If we are trying to get something over the line with say like an international team to help them like co-fund something with us, it's definitely better to have that kind of, yeah, as you said, runs on the board. Yeah. Anything else catch your eye? I'm saying this because I, we get a lot of people pitch to us to work with us and I got an email the other day and I was sort of scanning through it, but right at the end, um, the person signed off with like happy taco Tuesday and it was a <laughs> cat dancing with a taco in its hand. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. I just stopped and I was looking at that and I'm like, Oh, and I actually went back and read it again because I was just, it actually got my attention. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, Oh, and I actually re- re- replied back to that person straight away uh, and commented on it. But you know, well, is it, I mean, obviously you don't want gimmicks. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. worked for me, but <laughs> everybody well, include happy yeah. taco Tuesday. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the cat as well. <laughs> yeah. But like, is there any other way to, to grab your attention? Do you think? Um, obviously merit's the biggest one, but yeah, yeah, for sure. I am. Hang on, what, what, hang on. What's the, but maybe flip it. What's the typical pitch that you get that mm. is wrong? Like what do you get in front of you? And Fred, you can probably talk to this as well. What's the stereotypical creator pitch that is just like barely even gets a look? 
Well, you see a ton of it probably. We, I think it's basically just that one pager that I don't even understand <laughs> what the show's about. <laughs> like sometimes from someone you don't know. Yeah, either. yeah, and then also it'll just be like telling me who like who the character is. But, like, I don't know what's happening or the story or anything like that. Like, I have no sense of where this is going. It's just like, oh, this is this this person. You can give a real good rundown of who, who the character is and that's it. And you're just like, yeah, but what? Like, what is it? <laughs> like, that's... like You're not intrigued enough to no, find no, out more? No, no, no. <laughs> but then also we've actually had people, like, come in and, like, pitch to us. Like, got to that point of coming and pitching to us and then, like, saying, oh, like, pitching to us as if we were the comedy channel. So, like, not even uh, knowing who they're coming in to meet as well. Comedy Channel is lovely. They carry a lot of our content, so they're great people, but we're not them. So, it's just kind of like, okay, you don't know who you are. That would have been with. super awkward coming in, and that's why it's right for the Comedy Channel. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and this is going to go out on Foxtel, and, all this is, and you carry these shows, and they'll start, like, naming, like, other shows the Comedy Channel have made, and you're like, that's not right. Do you call them up on it, or do you just... No, sometimes you just let it walk play out. out. Let oh, it play out. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And it's like, okay, good to see you. Bye. Oh, no. <laughs> So that's another that's another kind of tip is like know who you're meeting yeah. as well. So that's probably yeah. <laughs> Fred, while we're on it, I think we've talked about it before, but what's it? We get pitches. Yeah, and I mean we work, work with a lot of brands as well, and um, it's just interesting, like what gets through and what doesn't. Yeah, I um, mean we've seen people like we've seen like literally like eight to ten page emails telling them why we're, they're so good. Like if that's the first email they sent, right? Yeah. Um, and you just look at it and go, I, I don't think you realize how little time yeah. people have. Um, I mean, you want to get their attention. You want to mm. show your value. Yeah. You want to show that you align with the brand you're talking to yeah. at its core. But, you know, eight pages trying to describe, they think, well, I'm putting all this effort in. They're going to love it. It's yeah. not going to get read. Really. No, well, that's the thing as well. That's why we love a good, like, I always say to someone, a good one pager is great. Like if yeah. someone's going to, like, what do you want us to send into you? I'm like links to your previous like previous work or anything that you think kind of fits what you're pitching in and then also just a one page on what it is. Mm. Like when you yeah get into that realm where it's like 10 pages, like I don't have time for this. Like I want to get an idea of what it is like straight away and that's it. Like mm. I just don't want to like fall asleep while I'm going through this kind of thing and I don't want to like go through the entire series now. Like I'd like to see it at a later point. Yeah. But I think the thing is as well that I – good example actually of something that did grab our attention was um, when we worked with uh, Sam Campbell on Nippers, when he was doing the scripts originally, his like descriptions in between the actual dialogue was what made that show. Like it was just like really intense, like weird language and you could hear his like stand up in the description kind of thing. And I think that made a big difference when we're like looking at that project and going, oh yeah, like that, has legs is going to be really weird because like he's obviously you kind of get inside his like fucked up brain there and it's just like <laughs> really weird thoughts and you're like oh but like the fact that we're sitting there going oh that's like making us feel a certain way that was like a really good in I think for that project yeah does, it, does a pitch have to be funny then it's a comedy like yeah well like yeah I yeah. is that like you know is that I, like a deal breaker like the concept might be funny but every the way it's packaged is just yeah dry the, eyes. yeah there's some things there's like. I think some people, sometimes we get pictures that are like kind of want to be political, but then also funny at the same time. But then they kind of lean too much into the political angle of it. And you're like, where's, where's the funny kind of mm. thing? Like they, they can sit there and like say at the top, like, oh, it's like Broad City. So it's like commenting on like real world things, but it's still funny. But then they start going through like how, like what it is. And you're like, okay, but like, where's the funny? You can't just say, oh, it's like Broad City. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, you know, five, ten years ago when you're pitching to network there's this idea of like funny is it's a very it's like their idea of funny was okay this is what networks think it's funny yeah. this is what the ad audience will think it's funny you've got now all these different audiences mm -hmm. and you know what might have been completely unviable in terms of funny you know a while yeah. ago is now super funny to that audience yeah um and you scale that out uh, globally and it's a huge audience so how do you judge like what do you think is going to be funny well, that's the thing, like with Comedy Central, I think as a brand as well, that we do have that kind of like wide range of like, yes, we do sit in just literal like more like political shows. Like mm. we've got um, like Trevor Noel, but then you've got the other side of that, like Jim Jeffries is kind of bringing mm. his own like tone to something that's political. It's And then you can also look at something more like, I guess, highbrow. Like we just did a show called like The Other Two, which is like really well made and like great comedy. And then we've got like Tosh.0 oh on the channel as well, which is still a great show, but it's just like internet clips and just like dumb jokes, like mm. kind of thing. 
So I think that's something we definitely need to take into consideration when we're looking at all of this. Like, who's that going to appeal to? What audiences do we already have there? Like, say on Facebook, we actually have a very, like, young male audience who like Bunnings memes because, like, that's what we can <laughs> see from, like, the research on that. Because cause when we initially launched the channel, we got a lot of um, Mike Nolan fans coming across to Comedy Central. So a lot of the, that audience is still there. So stuff that we're thinking about that works on social and stuff sometimes has to appeal to that kind of audience. But then also I think if we know we've got that strong audience there. Is there someone we're not hitting? So when a project comes in, we're like, oh yeah, we're not really hitting like young females or something at the moment. Mm. So why this project actually sounds great because we haven't opened ourselves up to that audience yet. So that's kind of yeah. something we can look at what we've done in the past and be like, yeah, that's great hitting that audience. But then also we just got to open ourselves up to kind of broadening our horizons, I guess. And I guess you're looking for what can travel across other audiences too, in different, um, internationally as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I mean, there are some bits of content that come out that are, you'd think are very specific to a region, whether that's, you know, Australia, US, you know, different parts of the world, yep. whatever it is. Um, for example, you guys worked with the Big Les show. Yes. Um, that is very Australian. Yes. And it is approach, but it's got a big audience. Massive audience. Globally, yep. right? So, um, and if anyone out there hasn't seen it, you should check it out. It actually is very funny. Yeah, it's great. Um, were you surprised with how well that traveled? Yeah, that was like, we obviously knew they had that massive audience there before we worked with them, but it was just crazy to see how engaged their fans are because mm. that was obviously something we were looking at from afar as in like, oh, you can see the subscribers, you can see the views kind of thing. We know there's a few fan pages, but then once that kind of fan group came over to like our socials and stuff and you see how engaged they are and then how like commenting like, where's this, what's going on here kind of thing. It was just like they wanted like more and more and they just like ate up like anything that we put out. So even after we like launched a series on the site, we just keep like repurposing some of the content into like memes and that. And it was just like stuff they ate up basically. Mm. So it was, yeah, I think it's something that we knew that was there, but actually seeing it like them being engaged with us on our side was like something kind of completely new. And especially for like the brand was just so fresh as well. I think having that really engaged audience from the start was like really like interesting and a big like learning curve. It was so I guess for the people who don't know who that is, can you briefly describe the show and then after that explain why do you think everyone found it so funny? Yeah. So the big Les show, oh God, it's hard to explain. <laughs> actually, yeah. oh, I'm, actually, I, 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 I'm doing this because I remember when I hadn't seen it, my brother was trying to explain it to me. I was like, what the hell are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. But then you see it and you're like, oh, I, I, I get it. Yeah. It's like, it's very Australian. There's like a main guy, obviously Les, who has a bunch of friends who are Sasquatches, which are like, if people don't know, it's like a Yeti, yeah. who are stoners. It's very, okay, it's very stoner heavy. This is so weird to actually say out loud now. Um, and <laughs> then it's kind of very sci-fi-ish, like trippy. So it involves like alien kind of things that are coming. It's very like action heavy. Like Big Leds is like this big action man kind of guy who's like taking on these like alien things that look like Homer Simpson basically. And he's just like protecting... He's even protect. He's protecting his son half the time. I don't know. <laughs> it's just anyway. So it's this very like ochre, Australian sounding, bogan stoner kind of world where a bunch of mates go out, get stoned, fight a bunch of Homer Simpson looking motherfuckers, and that's I don't know. That's oh my god. <laughs> was that the? I pitch? was not ready. No, <laughs> no, no. Okay, no. So actually, with that. Okay, so with that um, particular project for us, so they'd already created three seasons of this show on YouTube. Oh, also. I guess to note, if you haven't seen it as well, this is all drawn in paint. So it's like this very like drawn, low- Drawn in the- pr uh, MS, uh, paint. MS paint. MS paint. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's insane. So all drawn in MS paint. It's very lo-fi. The sound is like screeching half the time, but it's just like, it's just written so well. And it's just this world that you want to kind of like dive into. And that's why I think the fans are so engaged because- Jared, are kind of like the main writer for it. He created this world that's like inside his brain and it's like put it into the show. And I think that's why people have kind of found like a whole new universe that they can kind of like dive into. And um, yeah, so like from that, he'd created three seasons and like a film, basically like 55 minutes worth of footage, which is crazy as well. Um, so we approached them after they'd done that. They are working on season four at that point, but we obviously being new to Australia, like as a brand, wanted to do something quite Australian. And there was a character in that world called uh, Mike Nolan, who was a tradie. And um, our, one of the editors at the time was a comedian. He knew of them and was like, oh, it'd be great if we could get a series just with this character from the show. So we actually went to them and said, would you mind 
like kind of r- ripping him out of the show and creating like an, your own like spin-off series with him and they were like absolutely so right. that's how that the mike nolan show was kind of born and from that and for those who don't know trady is like a tradesman Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like a huge, bo- oh, well, bogan. They wouldn't even know the word anyway. Like white trash for yeah. American people. Mm. But yeah. Um, but yeah. So and there, yeah, that's kind of like birthed that series for us, and that was like, yeah, really successful. And I think that as well, the fact that he was kind of lifted out of that show, kind of gave a kind of gateway in for people who didn't weren't huge fans of the Big Lead show and just were like starting to relate to this like tradey kind of guy and that kind of got a new audience that way. And then throughout the series I kind of start seeding in the characters from the Big Lead's world and kind of introduce you back into what they were doing previously. But like most of all it was just about kind of having that character just by himself, just so you could kind of see what his world was like, which you didn't necessarily see in the Big Lead show. And then it all kind of like ties in again at the end. So Right. Yeah. And and why do you think that was why is it so popular like generally is there can you put your finger on it and go this is why it, it, it struck a chord was it i mean it is well written it's, yeah it is hilarious yeah i think for something that's so crude you do tend to really get into the characters though. yeah i do i think first of all because it's you feel like it's 100 percent original like yeah. you're not sitting there going this feels like anything else i've seen it's definitely like it's very like polarizing. I think when you watch like whatever whatever first episode you jump into, it's a lot. But I think once you kind of sit there for a bit and go through quite a few, you c- kind of start to understand the world and kind of the. It kind of just seems to like operate in its own universe in a way, and you just like I think that's what sucks you in a bit. And I think the reason I guess more on our side that Mike Nolan show was so successful is that this tradie guy is the one like that everyone knows it's a bloke that everyone knows in a pub or it's like someone that they've met before or someone's like uncle or something. I think it was, that was kind of that, that gateway, that person that everyone knows. And that's why I kind of picked up with so many people right. and like resonated that way. Right. Yeah. Interesting. But you mentioned before the sound was, yeah. And the, you know, MS paint. Yeah. Super low fire. Yeah. But here's, you know, big company like you guys. Yeah. Commissioning that. That was that like a complete, it, yeah. scary moment for like you know to come out of the box into a, a new region and just be like hey we're going to do something and it's it's a little bit shit but in a good way yeah i think it was more yeah obviously the numbers in that situation helped that right. project get over the line because if you show them like one of the episodes if you're showing someone higher up they're like what is this <laughs> kind of thing and it's just like kind of like so trippy in that way but um i think it was still even the process with those guys as well was very interesting because with other creators that we've worked with before we'll receive scripts and stuff like that we'll give notes and everything and then with them it's like oh no we're gonna get stoned and then (laughs) record while we're stoned and then like write the script from that kind of thing so like jared like jared obviously has ideas for the story and stuff and everything (laughs) inside of his head but then their kind of like process of actually creating like a proper script is it's probably not what they're used to because we're like a company that like, oh, we need to see, you know, what you're working on, that kind of thing. And it's just like, I think that's, they had to work kind of backwards in a way to produce what we needed from them, like mm. script wise and everything. But yeah, it was like very interesting as well. Cause it's like, obviously that process as well, working in paint and then like assembling it in premiere, I think was like basically the way they did it was just very time consuming. So like we hit all the deadlines, but some were very close. <laughs> like <laughs> I think by the time we'll premiere, so we're premiering like one a week and then the fourth one that we premiered, we'll, the finale was the following week. It wasn't even ready at that point. <laughs> so like, we hope it makes it. And it did, <laughs> but it was just like, I don't know. I think we just loved the concept and the ideas and those guys so much just because they're so great at what they do. That was just like, yeah, we'll take this risk and it, yeah. it paid off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, interesting this aspect of, you know, lo-fi versus the production quality people think they need now um, especially people who want like web series they put a lot of an effort into making it yeah. amazing um we worked with a couple of creators who had you know enormous audiences you know million million millions plus yeah um and the animation style is quite low end like for example mm. internet historian <laughs> very big audience very engaged audience yeah. and amazing stories but really you know the animation is pretty basic yeah you know um it's about the story. It's about the connection, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. What I was saying about the Mike Nolan, like, oh, Big Les Boys, you can see that as well. Like, even Broad City, for example, like, where that started out, that was on YouTube. And then 
that was every, there was no real like consistency there. Obviously like the storytelling was there and that was consistent, but they basically changed their format every time. So they'd work with different friends of theirs that were either producers or like editors, whatever. And when they engage with them, they change style depending on who, what they, basically whoever they're working with, what they kind of wanted to do, but they were the writers on that show and they were the ones that were doing the story. But so like one episode is literally this very like camera is just like in front of like locked off shot and then just having a conversation on the couch. And then like a few episodes later, you've got like a full on like um, episode that's like referencing, like do the right thing. And it's very stylized and it's all this like dancing and everything. And it's just like that there wasn't like, oh, we needed to create like the best product at the end of the day. We're just going to do our writing. We're going to work with people who know what they're doing because they weren't necessarily like editors themselves or like producers or anything. So like, let's with work with different people who know what they're doing, but let's just like be writers and act and get out there. And that's how they kind of got noticed. And they're obviously, obviously they had connections there because they were like performing at the Upright Citizens Brigade and then met like Amy Poehler and then she kind of mentored them. And then I guess Amy Poehler was that kind of uh, conduit there to get them to Comedy Central mm. in that way. But that was, I think that's a good example of something that was just very low fi not actually like consistent, but still you knew the story was there and it's still hilarious. Like I even go back and watch some of the episodes there. Like there's one where Alana's just like dating a guy because he's got a washer dryer. <laughs> so she's just like bringing over like loads of washing to his house all the time. And that's the only reason they're keeping like the dates going. So they've got some really great stories there and it doesn't have to be consistent either, but it's just like, I think if like, I, I kind of always feel that with creators, like I think some people like sit on stuff for quite a while because they want to make like the best quality product where I think you just need to start creating, mm. like get it out there. Because I think if you sit on something too long, you might have end up going, oh, someone else did it. Or uh, like, oh no, it's just not going to be what I want it to be. Like, don't worry about disappointing yourself. I think just like actually get it out there and actually have that creative like release. Otherwise, I think it's just going to be a waste, I guess. Mm. We're, we're kind of in that time now where that's possible too. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, the Broad City example is great, but also pretty much every other video content creator out there who is yeah. doing their own thing. So yeah, it's pretty exciting that that opportunity exists. And then the opportunity to go across or collaborate with other other platforms or, or other, you know, channels like, like yourselves, yeah. you know, now that's also possible. Yeah. Do you and think this sort of that approach, that sort of inconsistent lo-fi online sort of stuff will ever cross over? As in, do you it, think it'll, it'll end like up the on, stuff that's lo-fi will end up on, on, the, yeah. on the other screens? I think that's, well, you can, I think you can see that with, I don't know, if, if social media keeps becoming what it is basically and keeps like growing at the rate it is, because you see on like Facebook and stuff, I see like a lot of like comedy stuff that's out there that is just typical memes or like, it's basically like a clip show, basically. Like some of those like accounts are just like funny shit that's happened. I'll put like, I don't know, a saying on top of it or whatever. That stuff seems to be doing really well. And I don't think, I think audiences more and more that are online don't give a shit about the quality. Like that if you can get a joke across or get like a piece of footage across and you're laughing at it, like people don't care so much about how it's delivered to you. And that's why like, like Tosh.0 or like ridiculousness, stuff like that are these like clip shows like oh look this is funny it doesn't matter if, how shit it is or if you can barely see it on screen as long as we're like getting it out there to you there, so I think there's ways of that like already sitting on like linear platforms and that like here it is kind of like packaged in the traditional way but I think more and more you might see some of that stuff like come out a bit more in, in like the traditional settings I think as more and more people care less that's the see, this is a weird thing as well I feel like say like Foxtel locally, which is our big pay TV provider, they focus a lot on like 4K kind of thing. And that's like the big messaging like around that. And then sometimes I think, oh, that's interesting because you feel like the younger audience are like watching on their phones and stuff like that. Like maybe they don't care so much about mm -hmm. that. Maybe that, but that probably, you know, relates so much to their older audiences there being like, yeah, yeah, I love like my big screen, my, my big TV that I bought. Yeah, I want it to look like the best kind of thing. But then there's this market there that's just like watching like, Snapchat series or stuff on TikTok and stuff, and it doesn't need to be this like big thing to them. So I think, I don't know, you see bits of it now, but I think eventually you'll see more of that crossover depending on who takes a chance on it. I think totally, yeah. Well, 4K on your phone, if it's not funny and you want funny content, it's kind of yeah, it's redundant. Shit, yeah, right? so <laughs> exactly. When I'm on the mic.
Fred, let's take a quick break here and just give ourselves a big plug. We are super excited by this new initiative. We have created the Changer Creator College. The Creator College, quite simply, is a place where you can get a whole bunch of online courses, including our brand new Accelerate course for YouTube, designed to help emerging and new creators become even better on the world's biggest video platform. The reason we think it's pretty good is that it's not just our opinions, but the opinions of a bunch of really great creators and experts coming together to give you a very logical, structured course. Damn right. It is the college just for creators. So check it out at changercollege.com. That's C-H-A-N-G-E-R college.com. What, what, what sort of expectations should a creator generally working with a, like a network what, like, you know, how much creative control and influence do they expect from their, their partners in this? I think, well, I think more from our angle, we definitely have to have like some kind of like legal check on a lot of the stuff. So we'll have scripts that either come to us and then we'll say anything that we think needs changing. But to be honest with that, usually we're engaging with the creative because they know what they're doing. We like your tone of voice. We don't really want to touch it that much. Only if there's like a major concern in there. And then also legal kind of look over. Sometimes we've had nightmare scripts that come in something we've commissioned and then we'll have like pages of a script and then legal will come back and it's like red, 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 red <laughs> everywhere. And it's just kind of like, Ugh, like we don't want to step on you too much, but just be aware. This is what like legal have said about this. There's sometimes where you're just like, no, this is not right. Um, and then and you throw yeah. legals under the bus as well. You're just like, it's all, it's all legals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What they don't know about. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> um, no. So yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like we, I think obviously we've earlier on when we were doing some, some of the projects and we did take some risks on stuff, there's stuff that we've learned from that, that we can't like, obviously like learning curves for us, even just like working with creators, like making sure that they have the right people around them as well. Like as it, like they're having the right team and them and not just kind of being the um, like creator director, writer, everything, because sometimes that can kind of fall through or ideas don't really come to life as they said. So like we had one project that was meant to be, five episodes and then it ended up being four in the end just because the concept that they had that they filmed just like didn't end up working for them and they just said oh we're not gonna deliver you like another episode I was mm. like, well no that's not <laughs> that's what we agreed on but yeah sure um but yeah so there's like stuff from that we've learned obviously and just being like yeah we're just making sure now I think working with creators that they do have the right team behind them and maybe some of those um like incubator kind of projects that we don't necessarily take too far of a risk if like there is no kind of that what was that like having that kind of um background some examples of the kind of like what you've worked on before that is in that vein of what you're trying to achieve this time so I think that's a learning curve for us especially with people that don't have that presence already yeah. so you've mentioned these incubator type yep. projects what what would that kind of look like I mean um, you mentioned the um every damn day I guess that was kind of like one yeah, uh, it's what, um, what, would, more, what would it look like? What's a oh, it's more incubator in a way that it's that we're trying to help whatever the talent is kind of grow with the series as well. It's not necessarily like they're coming in and they've got the following like an Auntie Donna or the Big Les guys. We're trying to help them grow with the series and put as much like, I guess, support from our end out. So that's kind of where we'd say these ones are... Like, it's on us as well, obviously. Like, we've got to make sure these work for our audiences and, like, it reaches more people. And then they've got to obviously work within their network to try and get it out as much as they can, even though they don't have that reach. So I think that's what we're saying. It's more an incubator. is more like a risky project where we it might not achieve what we want it to, but it is a great story. And we do think, it, like, it sits on brand and it is still a good brand piece at the end of the day, but it might not necessarily be something that's going to get us, like, millions of views, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Let's just talk about this idea of attention, right? Mm -hmm. Because I guess a lot of the reason the big networks are now really interested in this short form space is because attention is shifting away from what they traditionally had to lots of other places. Yeah. Um, and a lot of creators, when like they still create with the idea of, you know, people pitching TV shows, they're trying to still pitching it in a very traditional way, but they're not yeah. thinking about how is this going to grab someone's attention, keep it there and keep them engaged for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, how has that idea of attention shifted? How is, as a company like Viacom, how have they looked at that and go, okay, we really need to start focusing on the short form because attention is so important to keep those eyeballs on the screen all the time? Yeah, so, well, I think that shift in attention is why the whole Viacom Digital Studios came to be, was because there was obviously 
um, the linear audiences there is obviously getting older and then obviously the younger audience is moving to different platforms. So I think that's why that was kind of birthed there to be like, yes, our brands have obviously, we're still going to be creating IP and all these like scripted shows kind of thing. We're still going to have them there, but we need to still be catering to the youth audience there because yeah, majority of our brands are youth focused. So with that, that's where we're creating that stuff there, but also like kind of woven into that is the content from our shows still kind of reaching that audience as well. And so that's not necessarily like, oh, like out on those platforms are saying catch up on a full episode or whatever. That's like us repurposing content from those episodes, taking short bits out, making them a meme or something like that. That's kind of how we're still trying to hit our audiences, but in a new kind of way. Mm. Same thing you'll see like, like talent from say like the the hills just launched um and they brought all like the cast back and everything but they kind of did press tours all over the world but even within our own brands we're doing like different types of content with them getting them doing like questions like asking each other so it's kind of like the like youtube kind of videos where you've got like the two talent kind of sitting there doing and then like beauty stuff as well like uh, one of the uk presenters got a haircut by justin bobby while she was interviewing like misha i think it's kind of like kind of taking stuff that is working like socially and kind of applying that to our IP as well. So it's not just necessarily just creating pure content for a youth audience there that is just used to that YouTube stuff, but kind of adapting what's working like on YouTube and then applying it to our IP and then obviously trying to move those people to linear or just make them watch it online as well. So it's still kind of as much as the attention's kind of shifted to like original short form, there's still us using that content and that wealth of library of content that a brand like Viacom has and kind of getting that to a youth audience in a different way rather than saying watch a full episode. Mm. Like the the Hills ASMR thing you're talking about as well. Is that oh, the Hills? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Well, like that's, yeah. So <laughs> it's not, I'd not necessarily like, so I was showing you the, um, so like Real Housewives, okay. like a bunch of people on Twitter at the moment are doing ASMR voiceovers of, um, like iconic Real Housewives fights at the moment and just everyone's enjoying them or like women and gays are enjoying it online. <laughs> so that's like really going off at the moment. So, but yeah, so that's like basically obviously taking content that's already there and just kind of applying a new lens on it because ASMR is such a huge thing at the moment. And that's just something we're looking internally to kind of like kind of recreate that kind of moment as well, just because we know that's the thing as well. Like I, the one thing I'm always like wary of as a brand as well is that you don't want to just seem like this whole like older naff kind of content, just going, Oh, this is fun. Like, let's just like throw our branding on it. And then that's like our version of it. I think it still takes a bit of like tailoring of going, Oh, what's trending how does that actually fit with what we're doing as a brand and how can we repurpose that for our audience and not necessarily like, oh, we'll just slap this on there. It needs to actually make sense. Mm. So I think in that space, it's very interesting and I think a tough job as well for a bigger company because that's the thing as well. I think there's a big reaction from a youth audience that see bigger brands that try to appeal to them, like you're trying too hard kind of thing. And I think that's where content that, that doesn't necessarily work when you mm. see bigger brands going, oh yeah, this is what are the, everyone else is doing. That's cool at the moment. Let's just like try and do it that way. And I think that's an issue as well with like, I think a lot of brands are trying to get into TikTok at the moment because they obviously know there's a huge like youth audience there, but they're trying to jump onto whatever songs are trending on whatever videos, but then just like slapping it onto like just their own content. And mm. I think the audience, the youth audience, especially is like smart enough to kind of see through that now. And I mm. think that's kind of the issue there where brands like us need to be a lot smarter about actually applying what's out there and like picking and choosing, not just going, Oh yeah, like all of this is working. Let's just try and like throw it on our brand and just hopefully we hit the same audience there. And that is, uh, there's a difficulty there obviously. So, but I think that's half the fun as well with it as well. How do you guys keep that authenticity then of, of content that you do create like that? I think, well, I, th I think that's definitely part of our kind of like brand culture there as well. Like it's, we have to, people who are there have to know the brands and know what fits. And I think that's something we collectively have to speak about with each other and go, no, this isn't going to work. Why, why are we doing this? This doesn't fit the brand. And that's the thing as well. Like you've, at the moment you've got all these brands during, cause like internationally now it's like pride. So you've got all these brands just like slapping a rainbow flag on their mm. logos and just like putting out pride content. I think everyone's kind of like seeing through that in a way where I feel like, say say brand like mtv if they were going to do something for pride you definitely do something either queer artist related or work with like talent who are queer in that space that they've worked with before something that 
fits and doesn't feel like inauthentic, but then you've got a lot of other brands that are literally just like, I don't know, just pushing their own product, but like throwing a rainbow flag mm. on it. And you're just like, that's not you. That's not what you do. And I think that is like a hard line, I think for some brands to kind of like get involved with, because it is kind of like, obviously, yeah, they want to be part of the conversation, but there's a right way to be a part of the conversation. And I think like, I guess a lot of brands around the world have got to kind of figure out where they fit in. And I think that's what we try to do in Viacom. We try to go, how does, how do we fit into this? And if you don't fit into it, you don't need to force yourself into that space kind of thing. And I think that's the same thing where we're picking and choosing, I guess, like what's working across like the social space and see, does this fit with our brand? Is there an authentic way to kind of put ourselves into that conversation? If not, leave it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It built in bullshit meters basically yeah exactly well that's the thing as well like say like an easy win would be like like gaming's huge gaming's massive we obviously know there's a huge audience there on youtube and that's a massive thing for us but our current brands in australia there's no like natural way for like say like comedy or mtv necessarily just to jump on board with that there might be certain ways like getting like you could say like for comedy like comedians coming in trialing new games that kind of thing that's like kind of your entry point kind of thing but you can't just like turn and go oh yeah we're just going to do all gaming now because like it's huge mm. nickelodeon as well probably maybe a bit easier just because obviously a lot of kids games and everything and that kind of resonates so they've probably got more of a space i think kind of to enter into that world a bit and i think they do kind of do that but I think that's the thing. You've got to pick and choose your battles, like what fits for us, what's going to work for the brand, and then what's authentic as well. So, a good thing for creators to sort of use that approach as well. You know, don't jump on the latest trend or challenge or yeah, mukbang this or spicy noodle interview. Yeah, exactly. If you're if it's got nothing to do with your channel and your audience and yeah. your tone, then steer clear no 100 percent. no no that's the thing i know obviously it's hard for creators in that youtube space to actually get that traction because you know they can just talk about the newest thing but if it's like inauthentic to whatever their channel is it just feels like so out of place so i think that's a challenge for creators to go where do i fit into this conversation but then maybe the answer is no i don't fit into this particular conversation i'll pick another topic that is out there so i think that's the thing you've just got of kind of like almost curate yourself in a way, like your brand, like how does this fit where? And then like, if it's not for you, don't do it. And I don't think sacrifice that. But I think most people, if you think about it long enough, you fit somewhere. Mm. Like there mm. is something out there that you'll fit into and you don't need to like force it to happen. There is something natural that you can do with your content that kind of fits into what's going on in the world. Because I just, as much as stuff is niche, I don't believe you're doing something that no one else is doing. Like there has to be something there. <laughs> like guinea pigs. I like him being <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's a throwback to another episode. <laughs> so what's next with Viacom? What's the next big thing? With Viacom in that digital space, it's definitely more looking, our kind of comedy especially, um, that international arm of it is going to become much bigger. I think where a lot of us are feeding into our like kind of YouTube audience there especially. So it's kind of cu currently like a Comedy Central UK page, but I think what the intention is is that kind of all of our regions kind of feed into that becoming this kind of bigger monster than it is. We've already seen that with MTV. So MTV, like UK has now become like an international channel and that's where like all the regions are kind of feeding into there. So I think that's more becoming, our brands are going to become more hubs for these areas. Domestic, I guess, will still do their own thing, but that's kind of like peppered into, I guess, what we're doing like internationally outside of there. But that's a big um, area of growth for us and obviously working with more creators as well in that space and hopefully hopefully getting um, us co-commissioning with that international team locally as well. Um, and then, yeah, I guess, yeah, Viacom always, I will say, is about growth. So mm. I think it's definitely looking in new spaces and obviously here they just acquired VidCon as well. So that's like obviously new areas of business. And I obviously, I said before, Pluto TV. So I think there's definitely new, because I, I also, I guess with Pluto TV, they're looking to take it a bit more globally as well. So I think that's definitely a new space that Viacom's going to be playing in as well. What do you think the opportunities are for the future for creators, like from your perspective? And that's whether with you at Comedy Central, Viacom, mm -hmm. or just in general, like what yeah. opportunities do you see for this creator generation? See I, how I dropped in, creator yeah, generation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's good. Good plugging. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I think, I guess with 
this current generation. I think, first of all, it's an awesome opportunity that everyone is so open to actually creating content and at least even putting themselves out there. I feel like we were going through, like, before this kind of surge recently that people weren't comfortable being on camera. Like, they'll start, or if you had a certain personality type, you wouldn't actually get out there. But I feel like there is this kind of common acceptance now that whatever you're into, whatever, whoever you are, that there is an audience out there for you or you can have a voice in this space. I think kind of going forward, it's, I don't know, there's so much going on everywhere that I think it's hard. I think some creators will find it hard to where they fit in. I think definitely when, especially like listening to your previous episode about the like beauty bloggers, like that's such an insane space and there's so much like drama. It's, it's insane that that was just its own world that was living on YouTube. And now that is like moving into actual like pop culture now. So like you're hearing about like James Charles and Jeffree Star and everything that's there. And they're like, um, James Charles is at the Met Gala and every, like, what is these little worlds that was like sitting on YouTube is becoming part of pop culture. So I feel like in that space, I think it's the right space to be in if anyone wants to kind of, well, I get, yeah, if you want to be involved in that growth that we're talking about, that's the space to be in because everyone is kind of like coming up through that area and people who are experimenting there are getting like those platforms are just growing. So I think it's better to be involved than not be involved. What I was saying before, don't sit on something. If you're like, if you feel like you're on something that's gold, just do it and start making it because if you're not involved in the conversation, you never will be and you might miss this whole growth there. And I think if you get in early enough, then you can ride that wave. So I think basically that's what I see. I see if you get more involved in kind of these areas that whatever you're passionate about I think there's a good opportunity for you to ride that wave and then also get in front of I guess like people like us or any other networks and stuff if you're part of an area that they're eventually going to want to get into then I think you the best foot forward is already having that like voice in that space so you don't think that ship sailed like it's too saturated with creators or anything like that or different types of content or pieces of content? I think there's always, like, I think there will always be that kind of mindset that, oh yeah, I'm getting to it too late. But I think everyone's got to either trust that they have the right, I guess, not opinion, but like view on whatever it is they're passionate about. I think if there's something that you're passionate about that you know you've got a certain message for, I think that's something you just got to stick to and like what's like to like tell your truth in a way because I think the all those authentic voices I think kind of end up cutting through in the end and I think you've seen a lot of successes there and I think that's the thing as well like Auntie Donna I think they have such an interesting tone of voice that I don't think I see anywhere else and it's like you watch some of the clips like some of some of their videos and they're just talking like one of them's just about talking about cum you know what I mean and it's just like that doesn't that shouldn't work but you've just, you come to know them for like their type of comedy. And then once you're involved in that world, everything just works. And it's just like, and all there's like another one where they're just doing like Coke in a room the whole time till they're like noses are bleeding and they're just like <laughs> screaming at each other. Like it doesn't like on paper, you go, that doesn't make sense. But I think they trusted their tone of voice. They knew what worked for them. And I think that's why they're guys that are like growing and touring and everything like that, because they knew that they were speaking to someone and there was obviously an audience out there and they stuck with it and that's why they're like, you know, reaping the rewards. Mm. We talked a bit about like the sort of specialised content or, you know, um, comedy content that has a very specific audience because they're so specific in the way they yep. do things. Is there like a, th a strategy around like bridging content for that? Like you said, Andy Donna, very specific type of content, you know, has a very unique sense of humour. Um, the Big Lair's very specific sense of humour. Yeah. If people watch that just off the cuff, they might look at an episode and go, I don't understand these guys and you just can move on. Mm -hmm. Do you reckon there's a strategy around building a bridging content that's sort of some of the way to what they do, but some of the way to mainstream to get them across? Because we've talked to a lot of creators who've, you know, created content that's got people in. Mm -hmm. and it's not really like their all the other content, but then they've seen that because they've already got buy in. You know what I'm trying to yeah. say? Like is there a is there buy in content you can create? Well no, I think there is definite ways to get that crossover audience. Like, but I think I think with some creators, they need to not be resistant to it. Like, mm. I feel like some creators like, no, this is what I do. 
I only want to keep doing this and then, but they want just to keep doing it and then someone to like, you know, boost them up at the end of the day or they end up on a network or whatever and I'll just get to continue doing what I do, which I don't, which is a sad thing. It isn't the reality unless you become like a huge, you know, YouTube sensation that just does the same thing. But I think with that as well is that something like um, the Big Les Boys, us kind of ripping out that Mike Nolan character, that is almost like a bridge in a way because when he was Mm. kind of siloed by himself, he did just appeal to this like Aussie Ocker audience without having the whole fantasy side to it. Although it eventually wove back into the story, that was kind of a perfect example of like, oh, look, there's this animated character who you all know kind of thing. So this is that in a way is almost like bridging content without actually like sacrificing their tone of voice. It was still in their style and everything, but they found like that was a character that was accessible within that world. And that was a good way maybe to feed them back into the actual like original series as well. So I think there are ways that you can go, what part of my content that I'm currently creating is actually accessible to other people and maybe lifting that out and creating content around what is still your tone of voice, but maybe appeals to a larger audience. And that way you can kind of weave them back into what you're doing in bigger picture kind of way. Very interesting. Cool. What do you, hang on, what do you look for in a creator you want to work with? Well, funny. Other than other than <laughs> epic content, like that fits the tone of brand and stuff. Do you look yeah. for anything else? Are there other things that you? Like, you know, I guess like, the thing is, are there any um, tangible or intangible traits that you look for in some like a creator that you work with or want to work with besides their content? Yeah, I just i I think the main thing is just having a honest look at the world. I think that's something I always relate to, and maybe that's what I was talking about before kind of that authenticity in someone like I think you can see through the bullshit where someone's kind of doing like especially in stand-up as well you can kind of see like I'm doing some like mass appealing comedy that just I want everyone to laugh to that everyone can relate to I like people that can kind of go there a bit but then they have this very like um, niche thing that's very personal to them and they're exposing a part of themselves and I think that's honesty that's the thing that I kind of relate to there and I think that's the thing that comes through with a good story is like something that hasn't been told before and you have you can tell there's an honesty in that tone of voice either in the writer or the comedian or whatever I think that's something that I myself relate to and I think that's something that also the company itself kind of looks for it is that unique tone of voice something that hasn't been said before so I would definitely say it's like yeah honesty in comedy I guess Mm. there were some creators we work with uh good comedians and they tried a new show called world news with cats I think we talked about this last time. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the <laughs> yeah. last, yeah. yeah. Hi, Lee. Hi, Ashman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because they, they did everything, um, you know, all those key things to get on, work on YouTube. Yeah. Um, they're consistent in a lot of ways. They did it for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, the premise was it's a bunch of house cats that talk about world news in their own way. It it was well, very... Wait up, wait up. People are, are listening to this will have no idea what the hell, that a couple of cats, it's... Two humans yeah, dressed, dressed up as, ha- as house cats, cats yeah. in a news studio mm-hmm. telling the news from the perspective of house cats. Now, just that alone, does that sound interesting to you? It sounds fun. I would. <laughs> I want to watch. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's, it, that's the thing is, I mean, after, you know, five or so months, I think they would have about 100 subscribers. Um, it, was a, it was a big effort. It was a hard thing. They couldn't replicate it. They put it, tried to put a lot of production value into yep. it. It was difficult to do, but it was very odd as well. But, you know, we've shown that, you know, odd things can get yeah. um, audiences. But sometimes it gets too odd mm-hmm. or it's very niche yeah. and they can't quite tap into the audience. Yeah. Um, like, what do you say about those kind of things? Do you think there are things that are maybe too niche now that are just <laughs> like this just won't work because the audience is so small or it's so hard to find? Yeah, there's there has there are things out there that I think, a too niche. I'm not, I know I said before, there's not like, there's not one thing that you like that nobody else likes, but if it is something that only a few people like, it's so hard obviously to break through on a platform like YouTube going, Oh yeah, I'm hoping that one person finds, mm. you know, this video of house cats talking like, I think what Fred's years. really asking is, are you open to a pitch? Let's commission. The thing about as long as it comes through with a taco cat. Or <laughs> like taco cat? Yeah. The, the thing about it is I think, if there would there is an audience somewhere out there for them, I mean, there, there has to be, right? Yeah. But because it was so specific and so odd, um, tapping into that audience, even using YouTube, was was a significant battle. Yeah. Um, and there would be some points where if they can't get that bridging content, they you you need to give up and move on to something else. Yeah. Um, and that's it's it's interesting because people think, oh, I, you know, YouTube is big, I will find that audience, but there are some things that you know it's it is going to be hard to do, yeah. right? 
Um, what do you, what do you, what advice could you give to people like that who think they have a really unique idea and you know it might be too niche? I think, I think with that, if you've got some idea that you think like you need to create it like that, sec- like that muse piece. It could be something that lives inside something else. Mm. Like maybe think of something that is a bit more broader that might catch people and then kind of insert that as, I don't know, like an element to something that is reaching more people and then it might be something that is like, so that could live as a segment and a, probably a lo-fi version if it was like a bunch of work to actually make that happen. And then if you see in that broader one, if there is an appetite for them, then you can start probably getting weirder and making that more of a reality within that. Maybe there is some way that you can grab something that you think is niche and then creating something that is like a broader kind of piece of content that you can kind of feed little bits and pieces into as well. Mm. I think you find that on like podcasts as well. You can kind of, you're there for like the main subjects of something because like it's like a, I listen to a lot of like pop culture podcasts and like, you know, I can see on the headline for the episode, it's like, oh, like these topics, like, yeah, sweet, I'm into that. And then while you're listening to it, they go on these tangents or something. You either either learn more about them or they talk about a topic you haven't heard about before. So I think there's ways to kind of like seed in things that you're interested in too while doing something that is broader appealing. So I think Mm. that's maybe a way to go for someone. Good tee up for my next question. Okay. (laughs) And perfectly. Speaking of podcasts, you've got your own. Yes, I do. What is it? It's called Vodka Sofa and Lies. So good. And it's about... (laughs) It's about pop culture. Of course. Yeah. It's about trash reality TV. Yeah. So good. And yeah. you probably should know more about that than most people. So when you say your, is it yours or is it the Viacom one? No, no, no. no, no. So this is separate to Viacom. Oh, Viacom right. will not want to be associated with <laughs> <laughs> this podcast. No, yeah. no. It's, this um, conversation has nothing to do with Viacom. No, no. Completely separate. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Me and my friend Lisa, who also work with, we just started ourselves. So we're both very much into pop culture, reality TV, trash. So... We just thought we had too many um, drunken nights together where we we're like, we should do something with each other. And then like we eventually said, oh, no, we should actually do something. And so podcaster was. So yeah, yeah. it's been fun. It's well, what do you, are you enjoying the I've podcast journey so far? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, the conversations have been really awesome. Yeah. yeah. We don't get drunk and talk about pop culture though. No, we don't get drunk all the time, just sometimes. Oh. So, yeah. so how long has the podcast been going for? Um, for a few months now, maybe like three, four months. Yeah. So and it's maybe if we've done like 14 episodes, I think. Nice. Yeah. What's the flavor? Like, I know you've got the kind of idea, but what, you know, what's the, what was the last episode you guys did? Um, so the one we recorded this week was actually about the Hills cause that just came back. Oh, actually, no, sorry. That's what we're recording tomorrow. Um, the <laughs> previous, sorry. It was like a good talk, chat. Talk wow. Ahead of time. Yeah. No, no, no. It will be great. Oh, um, when this comes out, it will be out. Yeah. No, no. We sometimes, we try to keep, um, Yeah, this is actually, so we try to do like an Australian edge to basically every episode because there are so many like pop culture podcasts out there that are talking about the same thing. So we do talk about American stuff sometimes, but we kind of try to keep it Australian just so there is kind of like a point of difference. So uh, last week we were talking about, there was a new Bachelor promo came out for Australia. We are talking a little bit about Love Island UK as well. Um, And then, oh God, what else were we talking about? Something else that's coming back soon, I feel like. Anyway, it escapes me. But basically anything Australian reality TV, we just like so bite you, into. So you obviously get into the trash. Like yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. I watch a lot of TV, not just for work, but just like outside of that as well. So I went down a YouTube rabbit hole. It was terrible. It was, I was like car crash, what, like watching a car crash. Yeah. Of Tattoo of Us. Oh, just Tattoo of just Us. Just Tattoo yeah, of yeah, Us. Yeah. The just UK MTV version. Show. Yeah, the UK oh, one. Yeah, yeah. With yeah, Charlotte yeah. Crosby. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Like, and I didn't, I'm not a, a massive trash yeah. fan. So I didn't know who the hell the hosts were until yeah. and I sort of pieced it together. But yeah. I went through this massive YouTube rabbit hole of like this shocking show where people, well, you know, on the surface, humans should be probably better to each other, but they get a, two people, yeah. you know, husband, wife, brother, sister. Friends. Yeah. Friends. Yeah. Frenemies. Yeah. And they get to choose a tattoo for the other person. And they it's always insane. choose something just horrible, vile yeah. and horrible. I think I saw one which was lovely. And the others were just. What was the worst one that you saw? Oh, I don't even like. I don't even know if I can mention it. Like Is there it was the belly one, button one. The, what's that? Did you see the belly button one? All right, you tell your one, and I'll tell it was, my one. Um, oh, okay. I can it, already okay. imagine what this is. This this is a two friends hmm. allegedly female, and it was a hand on her inner thigh pulling out a bloody tampon. Yeah, like, uh. like in like. 
human one-to-one scale. Yeah. And she actually took it pretty well. And I I can't remember what she gave her friend. And the, the worst one, I think, but even though the, the, all the, the other, there was really, really bad tattoos, like yeah. shockingly terrible things. Mm-hmm. The worst one, I think, was when the co-host, the hosts, mm-hmm. they were dating. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been Charlotte and Bear. Bear. Yeah. And I didn't, you know. And he, they did it. Yeah. It's like, oh, see this one coming. The producers are evil who, who decided yeah. that. And they did it. And he chose to get on her a tattoo on her back. They're not massive, but, you know, of the face of yeah. a half a bear mm-hmm. and the other half was a cheater. Yeah. And that is how he revealed to her that he was cheating on her. Yeah, horrific. That is horrific. <laughs> I, and I just went through, down this massive rabbit hole of YouTube for that and I've never gotten over it. <laughs> I can see it's like stuck with you. It's stuck <laughs> with me. It's just like burned in my brain. I'm yeah. like, wow, maybe this trash TV, is that what it's all about? Like, Absolutely. Well, yeah. the one that I saw was like, um, uh, it was two guys and the mate had got himself tattooed on his friend across his um, stomach but his, it was him bent over mm. and the belly button was his asshole. Mm. <laughs> that's where, and I, guess th- that's what? where I thought it was going. Yeah, <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was a lot. But he took it weirdly well as well. He's like, oh, fair play, mate. <laughs> like, they were, just, <laughs> I guess, yeah. they were just two lads. <laughs> 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 oh, Thanks, God. mate. I'll be one for the kids. Oh, God. Cool. Dan, so much information. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if anyone wants to talk to Comedy Central anywhere in the world, just get in touch with the local division. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And give your podcast a plug. Yes. Oh, at Vodka Sofa Lies on Instagram. Awesome. Boom. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. See ya. Thank you. What a great chat. That is super interesting because so many creators don't think they can work with big media companies. But these big companies really want to work with you. Indeed. They want to hear from you. And we also want to hear from you. So if you want to get in touch, remember to share with the community on the Creator Generation app. And if you want to be a better creator, check out changeacollege.com. Bye. See ya. Create a generation. Look on the mic.